Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Press Play Lifestyle Inspired Podcast, where we do interviews with inspiring people like our new friend, Cam, here to help our listeners find the resources, tools, and support that they need to be their best inspired selves. Hi, Pam. Hey, how are you? And thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. I'm doing well. I actually see the sunshine and that's saying something in Milwaukee. So I'm very excited. How about you? How are you doing today? Doing really well. Um, we're in Reading, Pennsylvania. It's a little cloudy here as well. So, um, but it's supposed to be warmer today. So that's always a good thing. Yeah, I like it when it gets warm. So I love your backdrop there. You must have like a little nook where you can actually work away from the house, huh? I do. I have my own little independent office all by myself because I'm totally not disciplined enough to work out of the home. You have to be disciplined to do that. And I'm, I'm not, I know it. I turned 50 and I'm good with that. So (laughs) yeah, you got to work with what you got, right? You work with it. Work with what you're blessed with. So I'm I'm really excited to have you on as well. I know that you've written a book and there's a lot of interesting things around the camel project. So why don't you introduce yourselves to the listeners and tell us a bit about yourself if you would like. Well, great. And thank you again for for allowing me to share my story. Um, We really started the Camel Project about three years ago to really help people. And it came about really because of the Parkland shooting uh, at the school in Florida. And that really promoted us uh, to start a program that can really help and support children who aren't getting the, the relationship or coping skills that they need in today's uh, societies. So with the with the virus now and the social lockdown, social dis I call it lockdown, uh, my concern is is has grown because I'm not sure how we're gonna come out of this. How are kids gonna take social distancing? I mean, that's a very adult word, word for kids. So I, I've been a business owner for 25 years, an entrepreneur, I started over 10, companies so a little add going there a little dyslexia going there so um you know been there done that but i share my my story growing up in a um very idyllic little town that was basically a square and everybody knew everybody else and um it was a great uh uh, growing up till i was about 12 then my parents divorced and then we moved into a very secluded a uh, place with no bicycles, no friends, and it just made me do a turnaround. So, you know, we went, I went to school. Um, I was struggling with school. They put me in the special ed class, which in my days that was called SPEDS. So I was a SPED, and unfortunately, I was undiagnosed as a dyslexic, and dyslexics are generally pretty bright. So, probably the worst thing they could have done. I got angry and I got upset. And I was sad and lonely. And for a 12 or 13 year old, those are not really the uh, emotions those that I was prepared to deal with. So what I did was most, like most people, and most kids today have acted out and I acted out in violence. I committed a felony on our school. I was told I was fat and lazy and I would never amount to anything, and I was asked to leave school in ninth grade. So I did, um, and it was funny because I ballooned to 300 pounds, and you would think somebody would say, what's going on with you, instead of just making it worse by trying to isolate me more. I remember a time in school, they put me in a special ed class, which meant I was alone in a room with a stationary bicycle, (laughs) and then they forgot me. So, I mean, it was um, not a good experience growing up. So I committed the felony. Of course, that led to drugs, that led to suicide attempts. I was also molested by a family member in there. So all those things don't make for a logical decisions of a 12, 13, 14 year old. So, but what I do is I tell my story because I start with, you know, I have two college degrees. I've written four books. I've owned um, over 10 businesses and I'm an entrepreneur and I owned and started a technology company. So, and then I say, oh, did I mention the felony? And then I get everybody's attention. So I just, 
have felt how um, people react to my story, especially youth, especially these teenagers, uh, uh, especially younger kids, because I become a peer. I'm not a teacher or a parent, not that they're not good, but as a peer, they relate to me and then they tell me things. And that's why we started the Camel Project, because we felt there was a huge need for the ability for uh, both our teenagers and I'd like to start in first grade uh, to start learning about social skills, relationship skills, coping skills. And the only way to do it is by practice and by showing. We don't like to teach, we like to show our programs. We actually start with the adults. We do an assessment first, then we work with our adults to deliver and maintain a very um, uh, sustainable and replicatable, and you have to teach them by showing. So um, that's kind of the nutshell. That was an awful lot packed in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where we are today. So we're, um, you know, seeking some pilot programs. We have some programs. We work with some schools uh, locally. We want, obviously, to take over the world at some point. But, you know, we'll take Pennsylvania right now. But uh, in order to make it replicatable so every school can add this to the curriculum, we worked really well with kids who have touched on the either the legal system or started breaking the rules. So the kids in detention, this is a great detention program. Uh, instead of having a non-structure read, do your homework, well, we all know that's not happening. That's like wink, wink, yeah, okay, do your homework and read during this detention. And we feel it important since that time is already in the schedule, why not make it productive? So that's kind of my story and I'm just looking to help people. We are a 501c3, the Camel Project as a board and um, I'm the founder and the executive director, but we're looking for uh, programs to get the message out that these are the programs that we suggest and we support afterwards as well. So yeah, that was wonderful. a lot. <laughs> yeah, that was a lot. No, I think it's great that you're taking the time to share um, from personal experience um when i was younger my my brother was exceptionally bright but he was different and he was dyslexic which they didn't figure out until gosh i mean i think he was like in fifth grade and so he was bored because he was bright but he ended up developing a photographic memory because he had to do something to be able to read um, and I remember his biggest fear was always being called on. It wasn't because he didn't know it. It was because he couldn't, he couldn't read it all, but he knew what it all was, right? And yeah, then, that was, that was the worst when they say, will you read that next paragraph? No, like, no, 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 I don't <laughs> no. think that's going to happen. And then um, later in life, we have, of our four children, one of our children is on the autism spectrum. And um, I think what it led us to realize and maybe that's part of what your program is talking about is we, all of our children need us to parent them differently the way they need to be parented. And um, when they start acting weird, usually something's wrong, right? They start gaining a lot of weight out of nowhere, usually something's wrong. And just because they're a teenager, if they're in their room all the time and they weren't before, there's probably something wrong. And um, absolutely, that, yeah. So I'm, I'm glad there's a lot of signs. There's ahead. a lot of signs. And frankly, we're missing them. And every one of the school shooters um, uh, that on record has has been bullied. And bullies, you know, target uh, the perceived weaker kid, the weird kid, which I was the weird kid. So we like to look at the aggressive learned behavior of bullying. And we kind of start there only because that is seems to be the epicenter of it and that seems to be the core and once you're bullied because you're different autistic i get along really really good with autistic kids too it's people can't believe that but i don't know what it is but there's just something the way we read each other that we kind of like our non-spoken communication language thing it's really weird as soon as i figure it out too i'll be a millionaire but that's another story, but <laughs> I think that, I think they know, and I think that you, it actually relates to your bully comment, right? Um, people know 
even if they're being like passively bullied, right? That they're being treated like they're not enough. They're being um, set up for something that's coming. And if they don't know, then they're extra surprised. But I think autistic kids also know when it's safe. They can, <clears throat> like if you guys connect well, <clears throat> it's because they know you're you're not going to bully them they can they can feel a lot better than they can necessarily always tell but so with your project then you say like kids that are in detention are a good target to support um it sounds like there's a lot of great things that you're doing what are some of the signs that you know educators or parents can look out for that might mean their child could use some sort of support or intervention or or extra love absolutely and we like to think of ourselves as an interrupter uh, we not only like to interrupt the bullying behavior we like to interrupt people who don't see the bullying behavior and every one of again going back to the school shooters and that's raised bullying um, to the level so we we feel that if a bully once a, a target of bullying is bullied too far, they become the bully. And then that leads to self-harm, suicide, because probably 99% of the, the school shooters were looking to commit suicide. They were just, unfortunately, took other folks with them. But leading up to that, study have shown, it just came out from the Secret Service last year, every one of the bullied uh, kids that beca became a shooter talked about it. Now, let that sink in. These shooters, these monsters that they're labeled, talked about it. They were asking for help, but nobody was reading the red flags or nobody stepped up to say, is there something I can do? Is there, is there, can we, what's going on? You know, in a very non-confrontational way. Uh, some people don't realize they're being a bully just because that's the way they were raised. Well, you know, that's kind of intimidating. That's probably not what you're looking for. So we kind of combine the reputation intelligence, which is a program I created with CBT, which is cognitive behavior therapy, to really focus on these, these programs. So some of the signs we already talked about, a, a, a weight gain. I mean, I was weight, I weighed 300 pounds, like in one year. Nobody said, what is going on with this kid, right? Now let's just put her in special education. Sorry, that came off a little bitter. <laughs> Sorry. I think, Sorry. I think you're allowed to be bitter, right? I mean. Okay, um, thank you. No, but well, not that you need anyone's permission, but um, we're trying to, I mean, through your experience, you're trying to help not have a bunch of other kids go through something that will make them bitter as well or or worse right or worse and absolutely and i i know what the school shooters were thinking i felt those same feelings and it's frightening to think it's still happening so if you have a child who was social wanted to go to school was bright and now suddenly has a tummy ache and doesn't want to leave their room like you had mentioned unexplained loss of of stuff like their their book bags or their stuff in their book bag suddenly disappears and oh I lost it um okay uh, a great communication with your teachers and your school you know don't rush in after something happens that's the you know we call that emergency reputation mode you never get anything done really well you need to really start um, building your reputation as a parent that wants to do better and that wants to work with the administration you know there's always one that they walk in the door and everybody's like oh no you do not want to be that person so start communicating with your teachers with the two teachers aides i don't know what who they have in your classroom because every school is different uh, your administrators attend a school board meeting they're free and open so be involved in the environment where your children's your children are spending their time if it's at a baseball camp probably not good to go there but you know get to know the leadership and if they're in any kind of children's youth organization just be involved as a parent that's there to help and support not to not one to be judgmental and angry you know we got enough of those angry parents we don't need we don't need yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. We have lots of cranky parents. They're they're everywhere, right? Um, yeah. And so, uh, sounds like your story really sucked, and that but took you to this place where um, your heart helped you help others, right? You could have gone just as easily the way that some of the others had gone. What was the difference for you? Like how, how come, was there an intervention that, that, that helped you or what was that point where you're like, you know what, I think, I think I don't want to be hurt anymore and I don't want others to be hurt. I want to try to do something different. Well, my, my mother was very, who passed away about seven years ago and she was the very strong, uh, female voice in my life who told me I could do it, anything I wanted and gosh darn I believed her but when she when she passed away I went through some kind of weird I don't know what you call it but I kept like who's going to be my you know who's going to be my support who's going to be my cheerleader you know who's who am I going to you know tell all my good stuff I'm doing to and she's going to tell people that don't even know me about what her daughter's done. You know, she was that kind of mom. So when she passed away, I was going through this weird uh, thing. I don't know what it was called or what it is, but I kept thinking, who's going to support me? What, you know, what's going to happen now? And I ended up meeting a homeless teenager. And this kid should have been angry and, you know, should have been doing a lot of things but he wasn't, and he was like very, um, not happy, but very settled with himself and very um, in his own lane. And I'm not, you know, it hit me like a bolt of lightning. Okay, you dumb dumb, you're supposed to be that supporter now. You're here now, you have transformed from that person needing all the support to the person giving the support. And ever since that, I am on a mission and after 25 years in business and marketing and technology, I'm not seeing where this is actually going to end up as a bad thing. So it, it just came, I just, it hit me like a bolt of lightning. Okay. Get it together. Gockley, you know, you got kids to help and people need the support just like you did. So that's yeah, really that's beautiful. Um, my, I think one of the most beautiful parts of that is you recognize that we have a lot to learn from those kids too. You know, it's not just a one way street. And maybe if some of us would pay more attention to the kiddos that maybe they, they everybody has a way forward, no matter how far, no matter how bad the past was, we can, we can help them toward a way forward, but we need people to stand up. Right. Well, and that, yeah, that's, and a lot of our, our programs put them in charge. I mean, I talk to some kids, I talk independently as a CBT practitioner, and I talk to kids independent, and they don't have a future. They don't see, you know, how are you going to, what are you going to do in five years? Okay, sweetheart, they're not looking five minutes ahead. We need to back up a little bit, allow them the time to express themselves, because they don't even know how to express themselves. Yeah, they're and, trying to make it through today, right? Not and not. they don't they don't see a future. That is your job is to help them see the future. And first thing we need to do is getting get them talking about their good, their 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 bad, their ugly, their special, whatever they feel has to be acknowledged. And that's where again, as a peer, they tell me stuff and it wasn't it was weird to me that people would open up, but I spoke to a group of 60 at risk, which I said, don't call them that, but that's a whole other story, um, who are ready to drop out. Matter, right? Labels matter. So. Like. so I spoke to them and, you know, the toughest kids in Reading, Pennsylvania and in the Reading School District who have a really bad reputation. And you know what? They're just kids. And as soon as I said, hey, did, you, did I mention the felony? They're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but like that, we were having a th discussion to the point that when I finished, the security guard came up and said, can I share a moment with your, with these students? And I'm like, uh, sure. 
So he told him, told them his story and that he had a full scholarship to a bas to football, to college, and his mother's a drug addict and his father's in jail and his brother was murdered. And he said, you guys got to, you have got to graduate from this high school. And he says, I hear you talk every day. He says, I don't like your attitude. And I'm like, wow, if I can get the security guard to open up, I might have something here. <laughs> so yeah, that's amazing. So how can people um, get involved with your project? You, you're 503. That means they can donate and write it off. So what can we, can we do to help you help more kiddos? Well, what we are really trying to do now, uh, besides money, is talent as well. We also would like to, um, I'm a professional speaker and I go around and I speak uh, as soon as we can, of course, but we do Zoom. So if you guys are having meeting and Zooming me in as always, we accept donations. I don't really charge. We always like people to pay what they can. If they can't pay, we're good. Uh, so they can donate money. They can help us with PR and marketing uh, talent. And uh, we, you can introduce us to your uh, organizations or bring us into your school. Or you can, um, like I said, bring us in to tell us the story so more people get involved. And we do a really great 45-minute um, program on the signs and symptoms of bullying. So that's Wonderful. a pretty powerful program, actually. That sounds like it. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to meet with us. We'll make sure we share all of your information in the show notes and um, let, keep us, let us know when you speak places. We can always share it around. I actually, I maintain a separate program too called uh, the Caregiving Circus, which is about being a mom with a special child. And so mm -hmm. most of our audience is parents who have kids that are probably in the high risk to be bullied uh, uh, location. So we're happy to share anything we can for That'd that audience. Thank awesome. you. You're welcome. Well, it's nice to meet you and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank All you, right, Pam. Bye. Thanks. Bye.